Hey there and welcome, my name is Carlos Berres and let's start talking about what has been going on in the indie tabletop RPG scene. And as always, I'm not being directly sponsored by anyone mentioned here unless explicitly said or mentioned otherwise. And all the links will be in the description together with some timestamps so that you can jump to the subject that is better strikes your fancy. And some links may have affiliate links, so it will help me but doesn't cost you anything extra just so that you are aware of it. And you can even jump directly to the interview with Anna from Double Proficiency that right now, together with Exalted Funerals, has the Herbalist Primer on Kickstarter and it's doing pretty damn well, surpassing the $300,000 mark. So I do believe that it's a pretty damn well. But also on crowdfunding, we will talk about Fallen, that is on each funding. It is each funding, the crowdfunding made through each.io and it is a 2d6 classless game happening around the 17th or 18th century. One of the goals of the campaign is to have the layout done by the immensely talented and more than proven great designer Guilherme Gontijo from RPG Latam, the Latin American tabletop scene. And the game takes a lot of inspiration of the regular horror genre werewolves, headless riders, haunted trees and all of the shenanigans from it. On top of that, you will have a society with ghosts, superstitions, politics, revolutions, oppression, esoteric monsters and much more. An environment propense for tons of hooks and opportunity but also progression so that you can buy the upgrades and new abilities since you are playing in a classless kind of system. Since we are talking about crowdfunding, this time around, another crowdfunding platform, GameFound, in it we have Down We Go, being published by Plus One EXP. Next Fresh Go is expanding the crowdfunding of the game and bridging the play, bringing actually the players to try and get riches and exploration on this Infinitopolis, or Infinopolis, as they mentioned. So you try to satiate its Infinopolis, and it started as a simple A5 page game, and now it gets also a procedurally generated city, making it such an interesting game to try and explore the OSR genre. And also, since we are bringing sometimes localization and different scenes throughout the world, right now we have on Kickstarter there is a campaign of bringing picaresque ramen to English. It is a Japanese game and it is already on its fifth version on Japan and it's coming for the first time for English language. And the game itself is what uh, on the Japanese scene is known as table talk RPG, not, ta not tabletop, due to the minimalistic rules they have a light rules approach and it is centered on self-contained one-shots, but that the characters can be used on another one-shot later on. So you have each one of the adventures, you play on one session and then you can, if you want, use the same character on the next one in kind of an episodic way. But this one, you play as rogues and villains, in a sense, uh, trying to get the upper hand on a metropolis. Inspired by Persona and Yakuza, it has marvelous art and a pretty enticing system premise, at least on my opinion. Another release, this time around from Sealed Library, We Sail Beyond was released this week. We Sail Beyond is a hex map generator with a twist. It plays as this hex map generator in a way that players themselves sit in a tavern or something like a tavern and they talk about happenings and places. At the end of the game, you will have a hex map that will be generated from it with a slightly modified version for the GM so that they can have surprises in it all. And it is a good way to insert the players into the creation of the world. And it also has the layout by Mateus Guax from the RPG Latin scene as well, which is a very talented one. And right now you can also get Players Do Prep Bundle that includes We Sail Beyond, but that brings together have you heard about the beast and glittering hordes? The first is for creating encounters, and the second one is uh, for you getting loot. So both of them plays with the players feeding the information. One feeding the encounter or how the beast will be and the encounter with it, and the second one 
on creating the kind of hordes that they want to see in the game. And also on releases and about RPG Latam, we have Sword Quest Addendum by Diogo Old School Nogueira, the renowned one. And it is a complement to the original game page that is called Sword Quest. It's a one-page game, and this title complements it, bringing some optional rules and also some seeds to expand on what the game can deliver. It also comes on the pocket mod format that uh, it it's easily accessible for you. And now also we have Old School Essentials that is openly available right now through Exalted Funerals, including the adventure by Diogo Old School Nogueira. And it is the any nominated adventure, The Halls of Blood King by Diogo. And we have this adventure that brings you into a manner of the interdimensional Blood King, the Lord of all vampires, and it calls for you to try and get his treasures and secrets and to see how the adventures will answer for this call. And on part of threads, blogs and the like, let's start with the blog post Holistic World Building Lost War Diversification about what in this uh, traditional Lost World uh, and how we can create different kinds of Lost Worlds like Fungo or Amphibian ones. They can help you in creating different and unique environments for your Lost Worlds ideas because we already see, we already saw most of the regular Lost Worlds and it's not innovative. And on threads, this is kind of old news in a way because it brings a thread by Johan Knorr from 2020 and he is one of the main creators of Morkborg but this thread was recently brought up to light again by Clayton noticing the person behind a lot of great informative threads on layout design and so on and this thread is more focused on creators because it is in typography and thus in a way inform for people that want to create games but it's very informative nevertheless so that if you are trying to read a game or appreciate the game you can also see all the work that was put there on the meaning of font and typography and without further ado we are going for the interview with the amazing Anna from Double Proficiency and the Herbalist Primer so let's get it uh, so we are here with Anna from Double Proficiency, and uh, we will start talking about how she got into the TTRPG scene and creating for it, and also plenty of different projects because she is an illustrator, she makes layout and also editing. So, uh, Anna, how did you first start with uh, tabletop games and RPGs more particularly? Oh, that was about 20 years ago when third edition D&D was released in Poland and I went into a bookstore and found an absolutely amazing, beautiful book that was published in Polish because I didn't speak English yet. So that that's something to talk about when we get to the translations. You actually mentioned it several times in your show that how great it is to have localized, uh, localized RPG books. And yes, that's why. So you can get those 12 year olds into, into the hobby. So yeah, we picked up D&D, my brother and my cousin and I, and started playing, which was super fun because we didn't know that the Game Master was supposed to be a separate uh, separate person. So we kind of had this round robin game, like we were switching the Game Master and playing at the same time because there were only three of us. So my, my that first was fun. Also was a little bit like that. Uh, we started First, with a Brazilian uh, system that are it is 3D and T because Portuguese, mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, when third edition came out in in Portuguese because I get, believe it was like we didn't have the second one we only had the first and then the third in, in mm -hmm. Brazilian and Portuguese and we also had this kind of round robin of each one DMs once because everyone wanted to play so. <laughs> But uh, as you mentioned, it is very interesting to have uh, uh, the, the translations. So then you start like 20 years ago and you never stop since then? 
I, I did not know. We were playing with, with my family and then I got to high school and picked up a more re regular team. So we were playing mostly Pathfinder and Warhammer Fantasy, which uh, the second edition of is still a very big thing in Poland. If I seem distracted, that's why. That's, that's why oh. my cat decided to join us. Special the other one, <laughs> yes, the other one would like to join us as well, but I have a limited space on my knees, so just just one kitten. Uh, and yeah, and when I when I got to Union to a big city because I'm very much a country girl, uh, then that just rolled out with Shadowrun and a ton of different games and uh, gaming clubs and more friendships and you know just just went down from there. But basically, because of the fact that we didn't know how to play D and D at the <laughs> beginning, we started uh, with world building and creating our homebrewed content very quickly, because we only had the players' players' handbook and uh, game master guide and the bestiary, because that's that that was all that was released in Polish back then. So we needed to extrapolate to do what we wanted. <laughs> yeah, and I believe that. A lot of people that start creating like mm -hmm. regularly then start because okay they start homebrewing something and then <laughs> yeah. from there they oh but maybe i will make it available for more people and then you start okay it's just my homebrew it's out then mm -hmm. oh but i could make it more beautiful when pull, polish some some stuff okay i guess now i am a creator or designer and something <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, the moment I got to uni and started going to gaming clubs and whatever, I, I got into card games and I got into war games. And then I moved to UK and started working at a war gaming company as a graphic designer. So I was working for Warlord Games, a historical mini war gaming company. Yeah. I'm familiar so with that was some, fun. some things from, from then because of the mini painting and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I, I didn't know that you you started working on uh, the wargaming uh, company back then. And then since your main is a uh, designer, you mm -hmm. went for with the part of... Because uh, you, in double proficiency, you have already some titles that you released, but also you worked in some other titles that were not released by you, like uh, I believe Old School Essentials. You, you did the layout for I, them? I did, yes. Uh... I started my freelancing company while well, Double Proficiency used to be just a freelancing company with me working as a graphic designer and layout, layout artist for other people. But obviously when you work on so many cool books and so many cool projects for other people, you want to make something of your own. So that's, that, that's where we are now, but yes. Yeah, and, I, and I, one thing hmm? that I enjoy a lot from Double Proficiency is that a lot of what you make are, is uh, system agnostic. Like uh, yeah. with the Duelist and the Conqueror, they are all system agnostic. And uh, wh why did you make the, like this decision of going with system agnostic instead of going with creating for some system that was already out? Well, I don't play D&D anymore. Shadowrun is a terrible system to write for because it is a terrible system that I love dearly, but... <laughs> Besides the point. <laughs> Besides the point, it's impossible to create content for it. Um, we just enjoy testing out different systems and we're creating our own and just, you know, we want people to have fun with whatever system they're playing because as much as system does inform uh, the game itself, like what you're going to be doing is informed by the system because you just if the game is combat oriented there's only so many things you can do in it but we want people to enjoy stuff the way they want that's that's basically it if we can create content that can be used for people who enjoy combat and enjoy social mechanics yeah how about uh, it and as you mentioned sometimes not everyone is uh like you can say okay i will create for one system but ah you can just homebrew to a different one not everyone mm -hmm. has the spoons for that or even enjoy that. So when you make it system agnostic, you are making an informed decision on, of you can just take it and plug in your system and mm -hmm. it will work. You don't have to make that much bootkeeping and all of that. So th this is an interesting thing. 
And uh, you, I believe that is the more focused on the art of the books or of Definitely. everything that you are <laughs> releasing. And uh, how do you uh, take this, this, this idea of, okay, I have an idea of what I want to make, uh, but I also have kind of my style. And what exactly would you mention as your style? Um, I like stuff that's old school, but modern. I mean, I, I very much don't like being uh, overly stimulated visually because I have some sensory processing issues. Um, and I like things that are simple. I just prefer things that are functional. I am definitely a fan of white pages instead of parchment colored. Yeah. Uh, so I'm mostly designing for accessibility. I'm designing for the ease of use. And I, I just like the feel of old books, but elevated to something that's actually useful for modern audience. So that's that's kind of what we did with old school essentials. We were talking about the design there because I made the, I, I did the layout for the adventures. And it was definitely a big point to just make something that feels old school, but isn't. <laughs> yeah, like tr try to take the essence of old school, but make it mm -hmm. useful for people that are just getting into the hobby because some layouts from back were like completely messy <laughs> yeah they were very much informed by the technology of the time and informed by the aesthetics of the time with and we are not there anymore and we have definitely more options when it comes to printing and to the color palettes and everything like that so there is it, it would be a shame to not introduce it but also we want to feel we want to keep the aesthetic we want to keep the vibe just just make it better yeah that that makes sense and uh since you were like in in this kind then we are now getting to when you are making your own book because duelist and conquer they are smaller books uh you have also some decks the wayfarer deck that i also believe that informed a little bit how you went with the herbalist primer that is like your big release or your big book right now mm -hmm. and uh what exactly is the Herbalist Primer and what it is not? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it is an interesting project, actually. It, it came to be only because I was kind of sad in the pandemic, like many of us. So I started drawing flowers because that's what makes me happy. And then I put up a single tweet with like, hey, what do you think about this layout of a thing that doesn't exist? And people went, oh yeah, make that book. So I did. So it is basically a book on uh, real world magical plants. Uh, this uh, this kind of weird mix of botany and ethnobotany and folklore and the occult with game master's tools on it. It's like basically all of our things so far are system agnostic, so you can just drop it in any game. But it is not, it is not, it doesn't contain any mechanics. So it's not like you're going to go to the chapter on poisons and have the damage codes for it. Instead, you're going to, you're going to find information about different chemical constituents in plants and how they're affecting human body and what are the lethal doses, for example, and how to counteract it. Because this is not, this is mostly a book on, uh, positive magic yeah, <laughs> it's it's devised as an in-game gu guide for beginner herbalists beginner magicians and alchemists so it it focuses on the positive things you can do with plants instead of the deadly and terrible although it does mention them because you have to be prepared for whatever the villains are gonna bring to the table and how to protect yourself so it focuses on curse break, breaking, on healing, on various effects like uh, protection from evil, from contacting spirits. Uh, there's just so many great information in folklore when it comes to plants uh, that just yeah, we should I, be using it. <laughs> I would say because 
back in the day when we didn't have as much uh, research and medicine, the modern medicine, we used plants by mm -hmm. for everything basically. So I believe that this is very interesting to see. Actually, we still use a lot of plants. Uh, when we start going to modern drugs, I mm -hmm. was. I, uh, uh, taken aback when I knew that a lot of them were based in some things in uh, Amazonia, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to have in this book a lot of information condensed and it's beautifully illustrated because when I look at, at the, the images that you were putting there uh, when you were developing it, they are very beautiful and also informative so that you can see uh, the names and, and whatever is the plant because sometimes we look at something and we, okay it's just a flower but it's not just a flower you can have so much more in that mm -hmm. and uh, I hope that with these seeds because it's kind of a book with a lot of information so you can use them as seeds to then develop whatever you want to have in, in your in your game and I believe that it's going pretty well in Kickstarter or um, amazingly well perhaps <laughs> what can i say <laughs> i am um, well yes it's beyond any any reasonable expectation and you know honestly beyond my wildest dreams at this point because i'm i'm still processing <laughs> i mean we were we were prepared we had we definitely with Exalted Funeral doing the fulfillment on the Kickstarter and the distribution, we are prepared for this level of success. It's not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're gonna suddenly fail at everything because we can't cope. The book is almost finished. The editing is in process by Jared and uh, Fiona. We also have had the science editor already set up before the Kickstarter. We were just hoping we can, we can actually afford it and we can. So it's it's going to be checked by a proper person with a PhD in plant biology. Yeah. So that's that's great because yeah. I'm a librarian. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a MA in librarianship. So my contact with botany at the level of actual like academic ended up in high school. But yeah. I obviously love it so it might be a bit a bit higher <laughs> <laughs> yeah because uh actually sometimes when even if we do not have a former knowledge when we start getting uh interested in something we start mm -hmm. researching it's like of course i i'm not uh, like you are not with a former law knowledge of design but since you no. enjoyed it you started searching for it and now you are a professional designer even if it's not like your I am, bachelor yes. so no, but, I uh, have I have no formal education in design or anything. So yeah, and uh, that is interesting. And uh, I saw that now even uh, Jacob, I guess, it will also be writing more for the book because oh, of yeah. the yeah, yeah, uh, of yeah. the stretch goals that you are. Uh, that, and this is amazing, actually. <laughs> well, Jakub, my partner, is basically the coolest person ever, and I say it. I say it myself. <laughs> so I am I am excited to have him uh, more involved in this project because I love working with him. Not only because he's sitting next to me, but <laughs> it, it's just the pure joy of working with somebody who's who's an awesome person. <laughs> yeah, and who you enjoy to to work with. So so yes. that that is so cool that you are getting to to this part, and I believe that since we have so many plans, uh, it was not that easy to choose which ones you would go in you would include and which ones you would take out so how was no. the process for that <laughs> oh the weeding process you mean? yeah <laughs> <laughs> well the original list was definitely different than what it is now uh i i started with this glorious idea that i'm gonna have it organized and i'm gonna have like 20 medicinal plants and 20 poisonous plants and 20 I don't know, delivering various magical effects like invisibility or, or treasure finding. But then I went into that topic a bit deeper and basically it, it proved impossible to separate what's poisonous and what's medicinal. And like it, it's all a giant mess when it comes to folklore and the occult. So I ended up just picking a hundred plants 
that are important for the folklore and for the natural natural medicine over the several late latest millennia basically so <clears throat> excuse me i'm kind of sick uh, but the list changed a lot and i specifically excluded plants that are so, that are too spiritual in essence because there are some stories that are just not mine to tell okay so there, there's a lot of people asking me about uh, plants like cannabis or peyote and just those aren't mine i'm I, I i'm a polish designer i'm very much in european and living in finland right now so they're just they're just stories that are not mine to tell and if somebody ever wants to write that book i'm happy to lend a hand but yeah this is something that is interesting uh, uh sometimes even in freelance we need to know what are up until when or where we can go like uh, so mm -hmm. it, it's very interesting that you are since you are freelancing for a long time i imagine you already have this okay this is my scope this is the thing that i know how to do this is the things that are mine to do well and actually we have a lot of stuff in uh europea europe and even more like since you are not from the main western european that we all like take a all Europe is just that. I guess that you have even more stories that people are not uh, used to, to to seeing out there. So, oh yeah, I must love. Yeah, because everyone is like, <laughs> okay, Europe is what uh, up until Germany, perhaps, and then we have so yeah, much yeah. more in in that uh, in Eastern Europe uh, that it's interesting to have your take, and it is something that uh, with in the news we try to bring voices that are usually not heard like rpg latam rpg c mm. but also when we talk about europe basically we see the uk scene and a little bit of things in central europe so it's nice to have people from eastern europe also bringing their voices and and having a huge success with the kickstarter so Yeah, I'm. I'm actually very, very happy that that's what you're doing because I love learning about the designers I wouldn't learn about otherwise. So I'm. I'm so happy that you're actually featuring various scenes outside of the mainstream. I mean, I know indie news, like I, I understand the pun, <laughs> but I I always find it super interesting when you're featuring those. Yeah, and uh, actually. I do believe that now you are focusing more on the on the Kickstarter, or but you also have the Wayfarers deck that recently got all out or something like that because you were mm -hmm. uh, putting them in like collections or something, and now it's completed or something like that. I saw that they were in print on demand or something like that. Yes, uh, we are basically uh, Wayfarers decks is basically something we came up with for our patrons because. The moment I started working on Herbalist Primer, people were asking how they can support us. So we created our Patreon with Jakub, but we didn't want just, you know, have people to support us. We wanted to give something back. So Jakub started making Wayfarers decks, which are basically decks of 50, again, system neutral encounters, def mostly non-combat because we like player agency. We're not just going to drop a monster on you. We're going to create a situation that you can turn into whatever you want. Uh, so, so we made those illustrated decks that were available uh, in a digital form, but people were, kept asking for physical. So we made them available as print on demand on drive RPG. And yeah, last this month this month we we got the last printers proofs from drive for rpg and we were finally able to release all of the, all of the things that we had done so far as print on demand so there's a bundle you can you can offset the shipping costs if you get if you get all of them yeah because a lot of people are not aware that you can have print on demand of cards as well because they mm -hmm. know like books but cards you also can have print on demand it's and i imagine that uh it's a process a long process like from from getting it in okay i have them good in digital but okay now i have to prove them and see that they will be 
with a good quality print and everything like that. So it's also a learning curve to have something, uh, I guess, uh, approved for print on demand. I suppose I'm on a very privileged position because it's like I've been working as a designer and layouter for a while now. So I just know how to prepare stuff for print. So that's that I, I didn't need to get any extra know-how for that. But other than that, it's just a matter of preparing the print files the way they tell you to do. And oh, that, that, that's interesting because a lot of people are not aware that, okay, you have uh, usually a version that is good in PDF, but then, mm -hmm. okay, you have to see bleeding, you have to see uh, oh, the, uh, yes. a lot of stuff that it's not just the matter of take the PDF, sent a professional printer and that's it. <laughs> it, it. It's not. It's definitely beneficial to prepare the files for print at the beginning and then just release a digital version out of that print file, <laughs> yeah. so, which is which is exactly what I'm doing. I'm preparing those, the, basically everything we're releasing in a print print ready version and just creating digital versions out of that. But the, the base is actually for physical printing because I mostly work with print media I'm not gonna lie so so this is just my natural natural territory yeah your natural habitat <laughs> it is it is that, that's interesting because uh for me it was completely the other way I was okay mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to start making books okay I can do a layout <laughs> uh, first I did layout in Microsoft Word it was terrible then I tried so to do sorry for you in LaTeX because I am from uh uh, yes. researcher so it also didn't went that good <laughs> and then I okay I will go with affinity and try to, <laughs> to yeah to... It, it it makes sense um I actually started with the layout when I was eight oh. yes some somewhere around that my school paper had I mean, we decided to make a school paper when I was in ground school and somebody had to put together everything that was written by other people. So uh, I basically ended up the chief editor, I guess, and the proofreader and the layouter. And as people lost interest in doing something like most eight-year-olds do, I think I kind of ended up making the whole thing myself. <laughs> Oh yeah, so so you started early with with all this design, and then I, I did. I was always very much into pu book publishing and journalism, so this is just natural progression. Yeah, and then it also informs why you went with being a librarian because since we started already with yeah. that, uh, and uh, did did being a librarian or studying to be a librarian. Uh, informed something in your creations from or for your love of tabletop games? Um, you know, actually, the, the thing that I studied was called information science and librarianship. So it's not just, you know, sitting in a library. It's it's mostly about research. It's about finding information. It's about info brokering. But also there was this giant pile of uh, book history and art history in it, because that's it's a part of the deal. So it definitely uh, taught me a lot about the visual arts when it comes to book publishing. It doesn't have a direct correlation to my tabletop industry in, in, in interests, but it does have a lot of influence on what I'm doing and how, for example, my latest book is created because it comes with bibliography, it comes with three different indices because yeah yes. I, I mean if you have like 100 pl plants it's mm -hmm. interesting to know how to find the one that you are looking for because sometimes just names are not enough even more that i believe that uh some names are completely different from what people use to to know them because uh, you have the uh, scientific name you have then the name that they are called in one country that is not the same that they are called in another country or even regions <laughs> <laughs> yes i mean i've i've learned botany in polish generally so uh, learning it again in english was a completely different thing and when i st started studying the plant magic let's say uh, most of the material is available only in english or in german or in latin 
and I kind of speak German and I speak very little Latin. I can read a bit, but no, oh. Latin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I most of my magic plant knowledge comes in English, and then I was cre I was working on this book and taking all those names of magical plants that I knew, and I was googling the Polish version, and then realizing, oh, I know this one. <laughs> Because from the description, I didn't, but then I found the Polish name and it just clicked. Oh, yeah, that 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 used to grow in my mom's garden. <laughs> so, yes, that, that's the one that my grandma taught me that I can actually eat it. So. <laughs> yeah, I believe that uh, even like for me, that I moved to France, I have to relearn really even spices because yes they are not the same name, even though, okay, Portuguese and French. They are Roman languages, but still. But that's that's not the same. No. It's not the same. <laughs> it's not. Sometimes I okay, I want that. Then I have to Google, and mm. okay, this is the name that I know in English, but is it the French one as well? Okay. <laughs> yes, that's that's why every entry that I'm writing. You okay? Okay. That's exactly why every entry in the book. Uh, has scientific name included so you can just do some cross-referencing and yeah. and find how it is in your native language because otherwise it would be just a mess and also that's exactly why scientific names are there and the, they are not there in botany to just pretend we are scientists that are speaking latin they are literally only there to like communicate equ communicate between different countries what is it that you're talking about because in in botany exactly like you're saying every every country has their own words and they they have little little to do with one another yeah because uh something that can be used for one thing majorly in one region is not the use that they use in another place mm -hmm. so they change the name because the name is informed by the use yeah sometimes. exactly and, and there are completely different co correlations and correspondences between countries and between cultures. So it would be absolutely useless and impossible to talk about if we didn't have the scientific names. So yeah, and that's helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. And that will also help informing more people when they are using the, the book mm -hmm. on taking that uh, in, into account and the local history or folklore that they can have of that plant as well. Uh, I believe Definitely. That, uh, Herbalist Primer is one very good initiative. I am very happy that it's, it's going well. And uh, I believe that uh, you will, will also be proud of what you, you put together and what will be delivered to people. Because I am sure that with Exalted Funerals, they are very experienced in delivering books all around the globe. So you got a very good uh, deal there. And uh, I hope that everything goes even better up until now. You have until <laughs> you have like 20 days, 26. The, 26 now. So it will be around 20 days from the release of the video because mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, hopefully we can have a great campaign. Uh, we are reaching the 30 minutes that regularly uh, we talk. And do you have anything else that you want to 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 mention? I think I'm good about myself, but I'd like to learn how you actually started with this show. Uh, actually, I started uh, in the news because of uh, it was Zinquest, basically, mm -hmm. and a lot of things are released and it's not easy to keep up. And uh, I noticed that I was keeping up with that in Twitter and other medias. And I thought, OK, perhaps I could, since I am already keeping up with that, I could make a video with some releases that more people could benefit from it. And it started from that. Uh, I That's had already awesome. the, 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 the YouTube channel. It was more focused on general content. And within the news, I decided to do like every Friday, I will release a video. And now we are over six months of weekly releases. And it's growing steadily. And uh, every time that someone mentions, oh, I back at this because of, of the, the video, or I check at this title because of the video, I am out of myself because 
it's I mean, that... this is my primary source of news when it comes to indie RPGs. So I'm super grateful because I have not, I, I don't have the time to catch up with everything. Yeah. And like if, sometimes... if I see something on Twitter, then like I see it, but otherwise. Yeah, people sometimes don't have these spoons and uh, with the indie scene, we don't have the budget of big publishers to like release in every blog and every part of ad. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that it was interesting to have all this information here. And then uh, with the interviews, I thought, okay, I am already there. We sometimes know the products, but it's interesting because in the indie scene, we have much more that of correlating uh, the products to their creators as well, because they are independent projects. So they are a piece of you of your creativity that you're putting into the product. And so I thought, okay, let's start interviewing people from this margin, may, from the indie scene and trying to, to put that face into the products as well so that people can correlate and see from where you are coming and, and what you are aiming with that. And that's, I am very great. happy that you agreed to, to come to, to this interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very grateful for your show because it's, it's literally my way of keeping up with everything that's happening. So. Thank you very much. I uh, have a vested interest in you succeeding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I believe that that's it for our interview. So uh, for everyone that is watching, go back to Kickstarter. Um, thank you, Anna, for your time in this early, not that early morning. <laughs> it's, it's not that bad. It's second coffee time. So yeah. So thank you. Uh, and uh, bye bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. For today, I believe that's it. If you like the video, like the damn video, share, subscribe. You know how internet works. You can pay me a coffee on Coffee, and you can buy my games on itch.io. You can support me on the links that are on the description, and I will see you all in my next video. So, see ya!